What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the microcast. As usual, today's episode is hosted by me, TJ David, and Zoe Rome. We're going to flip the script a bit this week and start the pod off with our hot or not topics. And then from there, we're going to chat a little bit about the Leadville 100. Um, I finished the race a few days ago. And, Spoiler alert. Yeah, I'm excited to to chat about my impressions on the event um, with Coach Zoe here and um, and the performance and all and get into all of that. And then uh, we're going to finish up with some Chumba Wumba moments from the week, including some takeaways around dealing with tough feedback, which I think will be helpful for everybody. Um, but first, if you're an athlete who's thinking about coaching, if you're looking for support in your running or endurance journey, shoot us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Our team of coaches is there and ready to support microcosmcoaching at gmail.com. All right, Zoe, let's get into Hot it. Hot or not. I'm excited we moved these up because these are a perennial favorite. So we just wanted to give the people what they want and what they want is hot or not. They want it. They, they want, want it right it up top. First thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like it because it's kind of like a little bit of a warm up too, before we, you know, really dive into the meaty stuff. And it kind of allows us to start on a positive note. So I'm into it. Our first hot or not is caffeinated gels. Hot or not, TJ. Caffeinated gels are, are hot. They're yeah. super hot. Yeah. I, I wish I had had a few more of those in the waist belt at Leadville. Oh, yeah. I almost never run without a, an extremely high level of caffeination. <laughs> like, my normal level of caffeinated is, like, like six cups deep. That's a high level of caffeine. Yeah. Um, so, like, I need wow. caffeinated gels just to feel, like, nor normal. <laughs> just because I can't, like, drink an entire pot of coffee while running. For Just for contrast, uh, listeners... I rarely drink caffeine, and so we're very opposite. In Although that you did area. have a little baby shot of espresso before we recorded the podcast, so things could get wild. It's race recovery week. <laughs> I needed a performance enhancer to get one little baby espresso. Yes, I definitely needed that. In one thimble of French espresso. It's all you need. One nanogram of espresso. That was the proper espresso. That was a proper amount. Yeah, I, I think that like the proper amount is one bucket. <laughs> one bucket of caffeine. Anyway, I digress. Caffeinated gels, only way for me to get my fix while running. Very hot. <laughs> super, super hot. Here's one that I know has, is, has become near and dear to your heart recently. What about mashed potatoes? Mashed hot or not? All right. I think mashed potatoes are, are super hot. Yeah, same. They're actually like one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite foods, just like in regular oh, life. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like in like IRL, love a mashed potato, love gravy. I'm a Southerner. I wish I could, I wish there was, if I wish someone made performance gravy, if someone did, that would be my number one go-to fuel, would just be like enduro gravy. Um, gravy and mashed potatoes are two different things. They don't necessarily No, but the, the potato is a vehicle for the gravy. <laughs> Well, they weren't serving up mashed potatoes with gravy at the race, so far as I know. If I, didn't I went into an, into an aid station and they had an option for gravy with mashed potatoes, I would 100% do it. Because I am a hard ass and I can do gravy while running. Well, yes, you do have one of those GI systems that apparently nothing can impact. I'm gravy trained. <laughs> um, I think mashed potatoes are a great option as like... Um, a whole food option for athletes racing who want to get away from gels for a little bit um especially in the nature's longer, gel especially in the longer stuff yeah like we had this cup of mashed potatoes rocking at the towards the end of the of the race and it was like it became more like a puree like the longer also, <laughs> the more hours it was in that cup people were feeding you mashed potatoes like a baby bird because i was trying to put that one at the outbound aid station i was trying to put them into a flask so i was like all right tj is an adult man He's going to want to be in charge. Uh, we were getting texts from Sean that, no, 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 TJ didn't want to drink the mashed potatoes out of a flask. He wanted them handed to him on a spoon like a baby. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I must have been incapacitated. Oh, yeah. You were headed that direction. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a resounding hot from, from us. Okay. All, All right. right. What about magnesium? How do you feel about magnesium? I feel like magnesium is like one of those misunderstood uh, supplements for athletes, um, micronutrients. It 
is kind of one of those things where like, if you're not taking the right kind of magnesium, you're basically, it's just a laxative. Nice. Yeah, uh, definitely been but there. if you're taking the right kind of magnesium, yeah, it's super helpful. Um, just for reference, uh, coach Kylie flying nutrition, one of the best, uh, registered dietitians in the trail and ultra running and endurance coaching space recommends magnesium glycinate glycinate that is going to i don't know help relax your muscles mm -hmm. um important for a number of different i mean doesn't it like help with the carrying of like electric signals around your body essentially so like for just like basic neuro functioning and like your brain communicating with your muscles and your muscles essentially be able to like like for the electricity in your body to fire, this is kind of fundamental. I mean, it's, it's really fundamental for a number of different things, not just, you know, neuro, neuromuscular function. Yeah. Um, but again, you need the correct kind of magnesium. Right, right. Um, and often we see athletes with blood work um, come up with low magnesium. I myself have had low magnesium. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common one for athletes. Yeah. Um, also essential for like taking it with vitamin D to support bone health. That's a big one um, can help with sleep as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you're an athlete who has like an overactive nervous system, mm. uh, you might want to get your magnesium levels checked. It me. It, <laughs> yeah. I can think just about like, con like, I wish there was a coffee that also had that. I mean, that would probably just make me poop instantly. Just like a, a magnesium caffeine substance. Talk about a laxative effect. That would be that. Yeah. Well, you know, the calm, I think a lot of athletes, um, no calm it's like one of those supplements you can get in whole foods it's a powder you put yeah, in your that's the one bed. that that's that's not the one that's not the one you want that's the yeah. one that you want maybe if you're having some issues with constipation yeah and you don't like gravy <laughs> um but yeah magnesium really vital especially for nervous system nervous system function um i would recommend getting that checked out if you're just one of those athletes who feels like kind of chronically stressed or like a little bit more fight or flight. Yeah, I feel like that's like generally like when we recommend athletes do a blood panel, that's just one, like across the board. If you have any sort of like, let's take a sort of broad scope and look at what potentially like underlying deficiencies or imbalances there might be, I always recommend like whether or not you even register yourself as feeling stressed or having issues with under recovery. I think that magnesium, like if you're getting a blood test, that's one to get. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, little related slash unrelated what about hot tubs are those are you feeling mm -hmm. hot or are you feeling cold we hot tubbed earlier today yeah i'm very pro hot tub Me too. team hot tub all the way yeah i think they're awesome um refer... i wish i spent more time in a hot tub <laughs> i would refer athletes back to our previous podcast talked a little bit about training for leadville um i talked about a hot water immersion protocol that i was using and, you know, you can definitely use a hot tub in the same way. I think it's great for, you know, building a uh, red blood cell, blood, pl blood plasma levels, and just preparing yourself for the heat. Also yeah. great for just a little R&R. &R. Um, Time you, travel. Yeah. Hot tubs. <laughs> if you are one of those athletes who like gets in the hot tub every day though. and then Hell some, yeah. That's what I have to say. I want your life. I am jealous of you. Up until the point where- I want to see your blood work. I want to yeah, know how you do it. Let's call, hold on, Zoe. Up until the point where it's productive, this is still a training stress. And if you're having trouble recovering, if you are feeling lethargic or you don't have as much pop on your workouts, long runs, I would taper back on the hot tub a little bit. Honestly, my life goal is to hot tub so much that it becomes a training stress. Like- that to me is like, that's an epic level of hot tub. I think the fact that you don't hot bath or hot tub could impact your upcoming race. So you might want to think about implementing that. I bet it's, I, I, but we're too, we're too far out now to, you know, I also don't just have time during the work day to take a hot bath. Like I'm always cramming my run in between meetings. So unless I'm going to tune into a meeting top list, it's gonna, gonna have to be a little more judicious about my bathtub time. Just saying, sometimes we need to get those extra 1% of adaptations in order to have that performance we're looking for. All right, international racing. Hot mm. or not? Kind of hot. Like, let's see. I, I feel like in the past year, uh, I've raced in Switzerland, France for MCC, Mexico, and Argentina. 
Um, all of them were great, but also international racing is so quirky and it requires so much planning and like getting, you know, like, especially if you want to be crude, like the logistical challenges are significantly higher. Um, you know, it's always like really fun to experience other cultures, but I sometimes don't feel like I experience them as much as I would like to when I'm like kind of nervous the week before like a 50 miler or 100 K. Um, so like, I love international travel, but I'm trying to get better at it. Yeah. There's like an art form to it, right? Yeah. Like, I think that we totally screwed it up last year at, at UTMB and then mm, like mm. learn from that experience and then totally rocked it in Argentina. Yeah. I, Mexico was kind of in the middle. Oh, I forgot about Mexico. Yeah. Mexico. No, Mexico was a, we didn't do Mexico well. I thought we, we napped like bosses. We like got the local Puerto Vallarta culture, which is pool naps. We ate awesome food. We balled out on food in Puerto Vallarta. Okay, um, but let me... But it's also, like, not a trail destination, so it's, like, a very weird place to go to run trail. <laughs> right, it's, like, kind of similar. Yeah, and yeah, it was just... It wasn't great for running. No, it was uh, terrible. It was probably some of the worst running I've ever done. It couldn't be really epic for r and I remember you really criticizing me for, like, over-coaching uh, on that trip and not taking enough time off, and I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I used that experience specifically, actually combined with UTMB and CCC to then take more time for me and for you yeah. to really explore and do Argentina right when we went this last time. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I think we it's, learned, it's, we grew. Yeah. I think it's like an art form because. Cause you, like previously our international travel has just looked like us coaching at different cafes all over the world. Yeah. Just like a slightly different background. <laughs> right. And that's not maybe the best way to be present. Yeah, not always. Actually explore and uh, I just love Argentina so much that it was probably the right place for me to go and try to also if you're a morning person like we are trying to find a place that serves coffee at 7 a.m for busy coaches very challenging in other places no you can't coach without a cup of coffee no oh my god no me, one wants, fine. I can't give feedback without a cup of coffee in me <laughs> no one wants that level of coaching the good people need their money's worth. <laughs> I think people should be worried if I've had coffee, coffee, caffeine. <laughs> great job, before, great job, great job, great job. <laughs> before uh, coaching, I would, I would be in a totally different mindset. Anyways, I'm really into international racing. I think if you yeah. do it right, you set your schedule up to take the time off mm -hmm. that you really deserve um, and need, especially considering and just, like, the travel. And right, do it yourself. That's, that's what it's all about. And, you know, the, the main takeaway is you're traveling a really – big distance to get somewhere to for a very specific experience and travel inherently is stressful doesn't really matter how far you're going but there's always a little stress and international travel is going to have the most amount of stress so mm -hmm. allotting yourself that time to adjust just take it easy take in your surroundings enjoy it do a little shakeout maybe check out the course yeah. um, and then just be really present for that race and try to get the most out of it that you can and then after you put the race aside, you know, you can do some of the touristy stuff if you want and just giving yourself the opportunity, like running can be a vehicle to explore and uh, think about new culture and see new places. Um, but you have to be intentional with that time. Yeah. And I'll also say like some of the relationships we've formed while racing abroad have been some of the most fulfilling and, and long lasting, you know, like with American runners that you meet abroad and also just like, I love running with and like chatting with runners from, from other countries. Like I made a ton of friends with that Argentina race. So I was mostly racing with, with other with dudes out there. Um, and like ended up with like a ton of invites to people's like six ski houses and a lot new Strava friends. So big thumbs up to, to like the, the relationships you form along the way. Yeah. I'm, oh man, I'm actually thinking about maybe going back and racing that race again in Argentina. Cause as heinous as that course was, um, I just loved the, like the cultural parts of that trip and just the new people that we got to meet. I think like some of those smaller international races, like really offer that rather like if you go to like a UTMB or something, it's just 
can be completely overwhelming. It's a totally different experience. Yeah, I'll actually say like the couple of other UTMB races I've done overseas, I thought they did a really good job of incorporating the local culture yeah. into it. Like in Mexico, all the aid stations were in cute little villages and it was like the locals running the aid station. When the UTMB people, it was just like cute little abuelitas handing out tortillas that they had made. And like, I loved that. Same thing in Argentina. Actually in Argentina, like the aid stations were very dialed. They were very like NASCAR pit stop, really great for like the more elite level. But also like, I really felt like they did a good job bringing in Argentine culture too. Yeah, it was fun. I don't know if if you've seen it, but there's like a little uh, clip of like me and Emily and Cody and some of the other like podium finishers drinking mate at the finish line. Yeah. And they were like interviewing each of us about like what we thought about the mate. And um, anyways, it's, it's just like little stuff like that, I feel like is very memorable to those yeah. experiences. And, um, you know, the reason why you would go, like it can't just be, about, in my mind, it has to be the holistic view, the 30,000 view. Like the race is obviously a significant part of it. But to get the most out of the experience, you've got to be willing to like be in the culture and yeah. explore it and get that stuff yeah. out of it too. Totally. Yeah. Like if you just want to eat macaroni and cheese and run around your neighborhood, awesome. You can do that for free. Totally. You definitely don't have to fly to Argentina. To you do definitely that. should not fly to Argentina. To do that. Although I did have some good mac and cheese over there. Nice. Yeah. We ate a lot of pasta. Amazing country for carb loading. 10 out of 10. Carbs are not in short supply or no they're a carb loving culture and yeah we appreciate that cornerstone of the culture yeah which we love all right what do you think about running alone um i mean hot or is it hot i mean you know i like it i you know again like the majority of research i feel like you just have to be flexible here right and i'm thinking like from my own experience i pretty much always prefer to run with kylie shout out to my c dale bff slash microcosm co-coach um, and I definitely like really benefit from like having a friend to push me on the good days or like when I'm having a bad day, it's great to have a friend that like kind of helps us, like helps me put things in perspective. Like we both ran the day after you finished Leadville after we had been up pretty, like we, you know, had been on our feet till 3am that, that day. And we were both like, man, I feel kind of crappy. And like, it was really helpful to have someone else be like, yes, like this, what you are feeling is valid. I also feel crappy. This is normal. Um, But I also think like, you know, for a lot, like there are some types of runners that can become too dependent on other folks. So I think it's like about having that flexibility and like being able to harness the power of running with other people when you need that push and when you need that pull, Um, but also being able to make sure that the, your underlying motivation comes from within and comes from yourself. I mean, you have to be a lone wolf and like never go to group runs, but if you feel like you are only motivated to run when it's with other people, that's, that's a, that's a challenge. Yeah, totally. I get too, a little scared to run by myself sometimes, especially for some reason this summer, I've like had a lot of um, trepidation about these long runs up on like the CT or, uh, just even close to home, I, I just have this idea that I'm going to see some wildlife that I don't want to see. And, yeah. and so like, I mean, I always uh, feel like, I feel like I'm a little cold on running alone. You know, not, peace so and hot. love to Kylie. But I feel like if we both saw like a, like a mountain lion, like, I don't know what Kylie's going to do to keep me safe from it. Like, love you, K money. But I don't think she's like my first line of defense between, you know, me and being someone's brunch. Bro, two is always better than one. And she's faster than I am, so that that, that puts me at a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> well, just my thoughts on it. I, I do so much training alone. That's why and... you run with me, is because I'm slower and I'll be the snack. I'm the <laughs> I'm the like I'm the I'm just like the meat bait that you leave behind. No. That's not how it would happen out there. Uh, that's would funny. you take a mountain lion for me? Definitely. Yeah, yes. of course. Of course I would. Hopefully I I won't see one. I never have and I don't want to. Yeah. I don't really feel that afraid of wildlife just because like statistically being hurt by them is so, so, so uncommon. Like the only thing that actually does make me uncomfortable is just men. Men are way scarier than mountain lions and bears. And thankfully I tend to be faster than most men out in the back country. It's like running in like cities and stuff that makes me a bit uncomfortable just because I've had experiences where like people have tried to like grab me or talk to me and... That stuff's pretty scary for a lady. 
Definitely super scary. I was just spending some of my recovery time watching some of those true crime uh, docs this week on Hulu. And man, like there's something about uh, secluded places in the woods that, yeah, just not not great. Yeah, you tough for the nervous system. Actually, yeah. I'm like, sometimes I'm surprised that I've never, I feel like almost every time on the news that a dead body is discovered, it's like by an early morning jogger. <laughs> and I'm always surprised we've never jogged into a dead body not yet but not yet it many, could still happen many years of running in front of us so you never know all right all right on let, that charming note yeah let that soak in for a minute <laughs> like and subscribe for more adorable banter um all right let go 100 Let's you did it. it i did it you yeah. did it how do you feel now we're almost a week out i feel i feel uh exhausted yeah fully and mentally and physically exhausted at a level that I've never felt before. Mm. Hundreds, man. They are a whole different beast. Yeah. They're totally yeah. different than any other race. Totally different. I mean, it's almost, I would go as far as to say hundred miles is a different discipline. Yeah. Than ultra running. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind yeah. of curious though. I know we recorded a podcast beforehand, but just to back things up a little bit, Taper, the taper was a challenge for you. Can you kind of walk us through how you felt during the taper and what you learned in that process? The taper was awkward. Like, gosh, I like going from an 80, like a 13 hour week to a six hour week just was so uh, new. I've never tapered that steep before. Yeah. Um, and it just, that whole week I felt off, like my sleep was inconsistent and all that kind of stuff. And it was your appetite was my weird. appetite, like everything hurt your brain. Hurt. Yeah. Like things were hurting. Like my knees were hurting. Like my knees have never hurt. Why are my knees hurting? You know, like my back got really tight and it was just like, all this stuff was happening. I was like, okay, this is a great uh, time to try to just like one, like I'm going to externalize this stuff with, with you, with my coach. Cause I need that like reminder from people around me. Like this is normal. Like you, like, this is a shock to your system, but you're going to be all right. You know, all that kind of stuff that I was telling myself, like I was felt really severe. And so I was like, I need a little more support. So, you know, getting that validation was super helpful. Um, but like it ended up, you know, as, as per usual, as the taper always goes, it's never comfortable, but then you know, the next week came around and I did a pretty long run, uh, on Tuesday as like, a you know, let's get that muscle tension up. Let's get ready to go on Saturday morning. And I felt strong on that run. And I did that run up high. I did that run at an average of, um, 11,500 feet and I felt good. Um, and then, you know, the next day, super chill. And then I took time off coaching and work, the business, everything. Um, Mental taper is so important. And this is like, I took, I actually thought I took off starting at 12 on Wednesday, but I, I must've wanted to do that. And then said at the end of the day on Wednesday, but it ended up being enough time. And I felt, um, really relaxed and was able to, for the first time in a long time, uh, just mentally, I felt like the battery came back. And that was something that I was really struggling with probably because of lack of sleep during the first week of taper that I just didn't feel like my battery was ready. And I was questioning, I don't know if I'm going to have the mental toughness to go a hundred miles. I know that it's going to take another level from what I've experienced in racing before, I don't know if my battery is going to be recharged in time. And I remember telling that to, to my coach, he's like, there's still plenty of time. Don't get ahead of yourself. And those, you know, 48 hours before the race, even with your book launch and driving to Leadville, I just felt like really, really equipped and ready to handle the demands of the race. And, you know, for me, this really goes back all the way to CCC, something that I've discussed many times on this podcast. I was just way too stressed going into that race last year. I let work and life really get the better of me. I got, I was off my game. Um, like I really learned from that, from the mistakes I made. It's been very difficult, but I've set 
the boundaries that I need to set and I've gotten more used to setting those boundaries. I'm taking more breaks throughout the day and the week. I'm taking more time off frequently. And those things are adding up to, you know, being able to get into that best frame of mind in the 48 hours of four race that I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just going to acknowledge right now, like this wasn't an easy process for me to do that. I have yeah. a lot of challenges with wanting to support people and have a hard time supporting myself sometimes. And I've really, I'm starting to rewire those neural pathways. I feel like really good about where I'm at with that process. And of course there's work to be done. Um, but man, like I, my vibe, my general vibe, I was super relaxed, super present. Um, I, I felt fully charged for this. Nice. I'm curious what your mindset was like going into the race, knowing it was your first hundred miler. I also to back up, how long had you had your high eyes set on the Leadville 100 specifically? And how long, like, what was your sort of like long term, like you didn't, you know, you've been running, you've been ultra running for 10 years, essentially. Why did you want to push the horizon of this event out so long? Mm, yeah, I've been, I did my first ultra about 10, 10, uh, 10 years ago. And, um, I mean, I think pushing out the hundred for so long is just kind of a product of my perspective, my approach, my personality. It's this process of continual growth that's happening. And I wanted to be as prepared as I possibly could be to compete at the highest possible level. Um, And to me, that means, you know, really going through that process of training over years. Could I have run a hundred miles? many years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And there was no doubt in my mind going into this event that I was going to finish. I knew I 100% I was going to finish. I felt very certain of that. And, but what I wasn't certain on was how competitive I could be, Mm. um, what kind of expression of my potential I could put out there. Um, and that was all kind of daunting and interesting to me to work through mentally and, you know, a little bit with my coach and kind of with you and, you know, with friends who are much more experienced in the hundred mile discipline. Um, But I think, you know, like I took the time because I wanted to be as competitive as I could be, not because I care about beating people, but because I care about seeing how well I can do for me. Right. Yeah. Um, And so that, you know, I felt like 10 years was a a good amount of time to, to wait. I think so often we have people who like they read born to run or they watch something on YouTube and they immediately get kind of like a bee in their bonnet that like, I need to run a hundred miles and I need to run it now. And uh, I'll just like from a coach's and and an athlete's perspective, you know, we say all the time, anything worth doing is not worth putting an expiration date on, right? Like any goal, any dream that really matters to you, if it actually matters, you'll be able to extend sort of the horizon on that goal. Um, So whenever I have an athlete, it's like, no, I have to do a hundred. I have to do it this year. I'm kind of like, when I'm hearing this, you don't actually care that much. You care about like, like uh, there's something else going on deeper that I think is worth investigating. And so it's always really affirming to see an athlete who is excited to uh, take the long perspective. Right. And I think that like, that's why I love the hundred mile distances because it demands that it demands respect. It demands a long-term approach. Like, sure. There's always going to be, some lucky athlete who like starts running and then like is able to finish Leadville and like will watch documentaries about them forever and ever. Great. Awesome. That like doesn't resonate with me at all. I am not impressed by that in any way. No, I'm not either. And I think, you know, the people that I really look up to in the sport have, you know, tried a hundred miles multiple times before they became successful or they were really successful at other distances before, you know, they became successful at hundreds and they really put their time in and their time learning to run yeah. their time, becoming good runners and building that foundation. Um, you can't push your ceiling if you have no foundation. Yeah. Um, it's about building a complete structure, a whole and complete structure from the, from the ground up. Um, and so that was, you know, my intention going into this was like, I feel like I've really built like this whole version of myself as a runner from the ground up. I put, you know, over five years of working with my coach into this. Um, and like, I felt like, you know, given all of that time and experience that this was, you know, the moment to go for a hundred. And like, 
I, you know, I was thinking about a hundred last year and I did, you know, silver rush and that's how I got into this race, uh, because I did well there. And, you know, that was kind of like how it unfolded. I didn't like totally plan for it. There was always the option to run a different hundred this year, but I think in my mind, this was the, you know, the 10th year or so was always going to be about that time to take the, take it to the full distance and have that experience for myself because I yeah. coached, I don't know how many athletes at this point to successful hundred mile finishes. I mean, must be 50 athletes at least yeah. Yeah. more than that, maybe 80, a lot, like not all of my athletes do hundreds, but, um, a lot of them do. And it adds up pretty quick. How, so Also, and I know we say this all the time, but it is totally great if you don't want to run 100 miles. Like, yeah. I don't think it's the coolest thing in running ever. I've been watching the track and field world champs all week, and it's making me want to get into the 1500 meter, which I'll be comically slow at. But, like, whatever is sick to you is sick. Like, don't do something because it's what's, like, big on YouTube or Instagram or whatever TikTok the kids are watching these days. The only reason worth doing something, because hundreds are objectively silly and like they're really hard on your brain and body only do that if it speaks to you if it doesn't speak to you fuck yeah dude we've got tons of other stuff you can do you know yeah. like a vk super sick 10k super duper sick marathon incredibly sick 50 miles just as sick like it i i think that like we're always here to dismantle like this narrative that people always need to be doing the most and going the longest to matter in this sport the only things that matter because nothing like actually matters because like anyone could go out and win 100 miles tomorrow and like your life is just like not going to change that much like it should only it's only worth doing because it means something to you so right. like don't do something because it means something to the sort of like cultural meta narrative about like what's cool or epic or hard ass do it because it's cool to you yeah i mean my life is the way that it is now because i chose to be on this endurance journey to try to discover where my greatest potential is as an endurance athlete through both skiing and running. And, you know, that's why my life is so amplified. It's yeah. not because I chose specific goals along the way. It's because I decided to be on this journey. Right. And you're just in it for the most fun and mastery or whatever value you're, you want to put on it. That's right. And like Leadville, you know, it could, you could just put any race in there. Um, Leadville just happened to be the opportunity I had and checked enough boxes of like a criteria for an A race that I thought, um, mattered because in the end of the day, it's a long race. You need to have yeah, okay. deeper stuff than just like, I want to complete Leadville. Like that is not nearly enough. Yeah. You're going to DNF if that's your only why, um, you might, you're never, you're not going to make it to the cutoff at Twin Lakes on the way out like if that's your only why um and it's tough because athletes they get so um impressed by the overall feat before they've even like started the journey of figuring out what is it that i need to do and for how long to actually complete this and complete this well yeah and i mean even thinking about uh jp gilpin who won it took him years and years and multiple tries to win that race you know like he also like took the mastery approach with that specific event because it's meaningful to him and he likes it. And I think that again, like so often, you know, sometimes the media will frame it as like overnight success or whatever. But when you zoom out, you're like, no, this guy's been chipping away at this exact same goal for years and years and years. Yeah. That guy's so badass. Oh man. He was rocking. Shout out to redheads with mustaches. <laughs> My brother out there. <laughs> <laughs> Your fellow pale brethren. Um, I'm curious, like if we can get into the, you know, race itself a little bit, can you tell us a bit about how the, how the day unfolded? Yeah. Um, maybe just backing it up just, just a tiny bit. Um, you know, I, I said, I wanted to go out there and compete yeah. and for me that meant, um, really getting serious about a time goal, mm. um, and trying to make sure that I held myself accountable to some, highest possible vision, highest possible outcome, and just saying, you know, it's this or something better. And I really like having that approach. It's something that I've been cultivating. I call it the champion's mindset. I've been cultivating it since the race in Argentina um, and trying to really access that like kind of carefree freedom of racing without feeling fear of failure, without also needing to win. 
um, but wanting to and wanting to challenge myself and not leave anything out there. And so, you know, my goal for the race was to run something like 17 hours and 30 or 40 minutes. Like that was my goal on paper. Um, and I really enjoyed that because I often don't, um, even at Argentina, I hadn't set and held that vision quite as with as much detail. Mm. And the more detail you have in well, your vision. Well, to be fair, the race in Argentina, there was no information about the course because there was not a course because it was all off trail. So it's very hard. Like at that point, when you're writing splits, it's just like fan fiction about yourself. Yeah, but you need that. You need to develop that narrative in that story. I think, you know, it, it can't, like, I, I had done that for myself and it became clear to me at mile 12 that I was going to need to throw all those numbers out the window because I had planned as if it was a race that was going to happen on trail and that was not the reality of it. So it's... like just a couple hours into the race, I was like, all right, this is not realistic. And so I discarded it. Because it's this or something better. And so my mentality, my growth mindset is that no matter what happens, if I don't achieve this goal, I'm going to grow, I'm going to learn, and it's for the greater good. All of this is going to contribute to my athletic success year after year after year. So it doesn't matter if I don't make 1730. What matters is that I have the growth mindset on there. I'm not afraid of what will happen if I don't make 1730 because I know I'm benefiting all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking less mentally than just like like physically like putting the splits down. I think having flexibility because there's a lot of athletes I see that put the splits down when they don't make it, it derails the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so true. But as you know, uh, in my experience, the, I didn't get 1730 or anywhere close yeah, to that, yeah, yeah. but it never once derailed me, never once derailed my sure, attitude. I'm just saying different races demand different approaches and every race demands having flexibility. Like s- splits work when they hold you accountable to that standard and they give your crew a guide map. But there, you also have to have the discipline to release that plan as soon as it no longer benefits you. Mm. I, I don't know if it's a release, but I hear, I do believe in what you're saying. And I think that it's vital. The flexible mindset um, is a pre- like it's, it's totally part of, if not, um, a piece of the foundation that you have to develop to come into this. Like, again, like took me 10 years. A lot of people will run a race like this well before 10 years. And in that time, you know, I've had moments of extreme rigidity around goals and suffered, uh, mentally deeply as a result of that. Um, you know, power for 2019, perfect example of that for me. Um, and so, you know, that flexibility that we have to continue to cultivate as athletes is integral in this. Um, I think just just for myself and speaking on my my personal journey, that is something that I've pr- I've well established within myself. And so, like, in terms of going into this race, what I needed to really cultivate was the not like a self-belief, but a way of being around going for the highest possible right. outcome. Cause some, I personally, I hold, I've held myself back too much mm. in races before, um, being a little too scared of what it might feel like to be on the edge. Yeah. And this was a race where like, um, you know, I got to try to ride the edge for as long as I can and could. And it was a really, um, amazing experience for me as a result of that. And I look forward to continuing in whatever events I choose to do in the future, whether they're hundreds or stuff like Silverton Alpine marathons or something in between like Argentina. It's just like continuing to race without that fear. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so walk us through the day. The day. How does the day unfold? The day started with a little mate in the morning and then went off to the start line. <laughs> um, it was. It might be a little too granular. Zoom it out just a hair. I'm not going to get all Christopher Nolan and start playing with scale on this one. Just joking. Prepare it for our three hour Oppenheimer um, podcast. It was an interesting race. I think, like, honestly, on um, the first uh, 12, 13 miles, I got stuck behind a lot of people on the single track. I'm still not sure if that was a good thing for me or not in terms of pacing. Um, I was a little off 
my splits kind of arriving at May Queen. Yeah, but it's just kind of like what happens at the start line of these big They're huge races. races. Yeah. yeah. Like, and there's a lot of people who um, lack self-awareness out there in yeah. our community. Um, I actually, at Argentina, I straight up got elbowed by a guy because I was like, well, I'm clearly by my UTMB index. I should be on the start line. Like I'm ranked among the top women. I'm going to stand on the start line. And a dude straight up elbowed me off the start line. <laughs> So, a lot of gentlemen, out there. let's not do that. Yeah, I just, I don't know. It was an interesting start and a fun kind of fast start. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't feel very energetic at the beginning of the race. And I just kind of kept that door open. And like, really, maybe I'll feel better later. Yeah, I was waiting for the sunrise. And like, I just kind of never really judged anything that I was feeling and really left the door open to just taking in the experience as it was coming um, and just being really present with my thoughts and feelings. Um, you know, as you know, I, I didn't listen to any music or anything like that during the race. I was just really kind of like attuned to me and what was going on around me. And, you know, after the first 13, I kind of like snapped into a good flow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was very easy and felt like almost a little too easy uh, into Twin Lakes, like, uh, it's a long section, but I don't mm -hmm. want to spend too much time on the nuance of it, but I felt like I was just kind of riding from the, all the whole day, really just this like non-judgmental wave and this attitude and mentality that I've been working so hard on cultivating in through training. So that way, hopefully I can take it into my life. Um, and that's probably another topic for another time, but just being present with how I was feeling, uh, this hill feels hard. Okay, it feels hard. If uh, I feel like so flowy on this downhill, great, I feel flowy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, trying not to like really um, judge or think I should be here at a certain time or should feel this way at a that certain time. That being said, you were super... within a minute of your splits the whole way through Twin Lakes. Yeah, and like it, and, and also, you know, I was within, I think eight minutes or so of my splits to um, the other side to Winfield. Yeah. And it was, and I wasn't actually, I had written the splits out on paper, but I had only, t I only took it out once. And it was uh, just one of those days where I just had the flow state. Yeah. It was um, clicky. Feeling yeah. Clicky. It was, I didn't feel a hundred percent. Like, like I said, I felt like just a little tired starting out. I was kind of hoping for that sunrise and like, I felt more tired than this I wanted. This is why the rest of us consume caffeine. <laughs> well, I started taking in some caffeine um, on um, the Hope Pass section. Mm. And that's where, um, you know, I was just loving the vibes of the yeah. race and having you guys out there supporting. And once the field spread out at Outward Bound, um, I ran the majority of the race by myself. I didn't work with any other runners or and none of that kind of like um, unfolded. It was although you were running right like for a while you were sort of leapfrogging with Paul Terranova. Yeah. Um, ultra legend. And I was like, man, I hope they're becoming friends out there. And there was a while we were leapfrogging with Mario Mendoza too. Another legend. Yeah, those guys, um, they yeah, they passed me some time around I think it was like in the uh, uh, no, seventy five or something. Mario didn't pass you until May Queen. May Queen. Yeah, like, oh man, I was running really well until I wasn't. It yeah, was, yeah, that's <laughs> not funny. how it always goes, right? Yes, <laughs> that's just like kind of like what I was expecting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Hope Pass section was my strength. Um, I left that aid station at Twin Lakes feeling really solid. For yeah. people who don't know, that's I think around a twenty-three mile section of the course. It's got five, six thousand feet of climbing in it. Which is half of the climbing. Yeah. Is in a quarter, a condensed quarter of the race. Yeah. And it like makes... Which is the, really, really challenging. Challenging, but makes the race kind of fun and unique. It's Yeah. It has like really distinctive sections. Yeah. Super distinctive because the rest of the course is like very, very runnable. And then um, with some, uh, some small power hiking sections and then, you know, essentially you got all the uphill. You're not running it. Like you're really kind of grooving. And that's where I passed a lot of runners, um, was on that first uphill. And it was very natural because the obvious, you know, people who know me, I 
race a lot of mountain races and that's kind of my strength. Um, and the flatter, more runnable stuff is not. Um, yeah. I mean, cause you were racing, like, uh, I mean, like you were racing guy, like one of the guys that like, you were racing a 210 marathoner. Yeah. So like, that's a scary person to be competing with on the back half of a very runnable course. Totally. I mean, there's just so many great runners and it felt like exciting and fun. Yeah for me to be out there in the top 10 on my, on splits that I knew yeah. if I could keep it up, it would for sure be a podium. Um, and I just kept that vision of the highest possible outcome in the back of my mind and was just like non-judgmentally running yeah. out there. And that section, there's a, a flat kind of grindy section at the bottom before Winfield. Um, and that gassed me. It was mm. just hot as shit. And it was, it was a really hot No day. water. And it wasn't supposed to be nearly that hot. Yeah. that's That was where um, I felt like deep fatigue for yeah. the first time, right at mile 50. And then um, I took a little time at the aid station to just get prepared for the climb back up and over to go back to Twin Lakes and um, pop some ketones, had a little extra water. And I knew I was like kind of in the mix still and there was a lot of race left and so i kind of was excited and i um i went down to the river and got super wet just to make sure that you know evaporative cooling was happening and i was going to stay as cool as possible yeah. over this next long section and i ran prs all over that section nice. um, it was super awesome i've just felt so good and then there's the out and back happening so yeah there's a lot of traffic, but there's yeah. a lot of positive support. Yeah. And so like, it's super cool to um, just be able to give that support back to people. Um, after a while, it actually felt, I hate to say it, but it felt a little mm -hmm. mentally fatiguing to have to tell hundreds of runners they're <laughs> doing a great job. Yeah. Um, I was pretty just crowded like, in that section. Super crowded. And once it really got steep, um, I was just trying to really be conservative with my energy, knowing that like anything that you say your body position, everything it can be, can take energy away. Yeah. Um, and so I was or just give energy, right? Like yeah, depending, depend, right. Depending. And like, I was just trying to be supportive, but also like really go deep inside and not overextend myself on that climb. Like a lot of people were like, you are within two minutes of fifth place. He doesn't look good. And I'm like, Oh, we still have a lot of race left. Yeah. Like don't, you know, this is not the time to try to like push. This is where you can lose the race. Um, and it was hot and stuff. And so I was like trying to soak and just maintain that body temperature. Finally, we got back up and over and I felt pretty solid, like at that Hope Pass aid station, yeah. refueled. Um, but the downhill was a bit of a nightmare. There was a lot of people kind of the stragglers. And that's when the carnage really, I think, you know, of the day started to happen. Like those were the people kind of like at the time you were coming down, those people that were just a little bit ahead, like maybe an hour or so ahead of the cutoff at 20 yeah, weeks, which yeah. is a really aggressive oh, cutoff. And I felt my heart just like went out because some of these people were sitting on the trail Oof. and just like, they were so supportive and I like wanted to help them. And like, I'm just like, oh, why are you guys in this position? Like, uh, like we can all be doing better, like not be chasing cutoffs like this. Like I just felt like... I don't know. Oh. I, I really disagree with Leadville's cutoffs. They assume a 20% slowdown. Like at Western States, the cutoffs are just kind of like they aren't graded on a curve, essentially. And it doesn't assume that you like, it, it, it just like is like, oh, if you make it, you make it and it's fine. But at Leadville, they assume you're going to slow down. So if you're slow going into twin, like they just go ahead and cut people off. Cause they assume like, which doesn't make sense. Cause like we've all done hundreds where you feel like crap at mile 40 and you can feel awesome at mile 60. You yeah. can definitely speed up. And it makes no sense to me why Leadville has such aggressive cutoffs in the most intense and demanding section of their race. Like there was a, a 43% finish rate this year, 43%. Yeah. you know, it was super hot. It was way hotter than it normally is. And I, yeah, I just fundamentally disagree with how they do cutoffs. Well, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it was, it, I was definitely thinking about it, you know, in my, in my mind as I was going down and trying to, you know, not overdo it on the down, but like stay consistent. And I, I knew I was probably falling behind on my splits um, at that point. And like, I just didn't care. 
about that. You yeah. know, like I knew I was close enough. Like it didn't, you know, the specifics didn't matter. And like, you know, you can't, you're not like, it's hard to be right on it the whole time. There's just too many factors at play that like, again, the flexible mindset, you know, that's just something that just comes so naturally for me at this point um, in racing. And it's just like, all right, you're just kind of like going and you're going to get there. And um, when I got in, that's, uh, you know, the aid station there. And um, clearly like everybody had gone through that could and then the people who could yeah, cut you, off. You came into Twin Lakes maybe like 20, 30 minutes after the cutoff. Like yeah. after the cutoff going the other direction. Right. Yeah. That was so fun, man. There were so many vibes like going yeah, on. Yeah, it was like the best tailgate ever. Like from the crew perspective, we were just chilling in Twin Lakes all day. We were drinking like hard seltzers, eating carrot chips, like hanging out, playing with, we had an inflatable unicorn, making posters, like just mad chilling for a few hours. It was awesome. I'm yeah. like all, like that is what I love most about ultra running. Yeah. I think that's where like I really was profoundly impacted by like the just the love and support that I was getting from you guys crewing me. And like, I really intentionally put together like the team for this. And it's, I, I have to, like, I spend like 90% of my life, my time, like everything that I've got basically is all about supporting other people to the point of it's probably unhealthy, you know, how much, of your identity is tied up in how you yeah. see yourself as helping other people. Yeah, like mm -hmm. something to work on. I mean, I'm a coach. Yeah. What do you expect? No, I know. I, like, it's just that's like that's definitely just like a personality type. Though is the person like and like helping and supporting other people is great, and I think a lot of folks can do that more. But there is, you know, like a person who find who over indexes on that as being the primary source of their self worth. Well, I don't know if it goes that far for me, but it's I'm not definitely it's, part I'm just of my putting identity. out into the world that it is a thing. It's a thing, yeah. Like you know, it's the whole thing that Queer Eye is based on. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so if there's anything we've learned from Queer Eye, <laughs> it's that a French tuck can fix any outfit, and you have to take time for yourself. Yeah, but it was interesting because I like in no previous race that I had that much support. Um, had I had people taking care of me asking, you know, how I was, it was like, I got like the tables got to be flipped on me yeah. for a chance. And I'm just like, I didn't make you uncomfortable. No, you I was, was awesome. very open yes. to the entire day and the entire experience. I applaud myself and acknowledge myself for that level Woo. of openness because that isn't like my default mode. Yeah. My default mode is to like stop everything and problem solve and help folks. I mean, that's a reason why I'm such a successful coach. It's because I put other people first and we all know that that's not sustainable. So this was just a great chance for me to like get into that other mindset, know that like having help, having that team around you is part of a balanced life. And like, I couldn't even, and even like the extended community that was out there cheering me on people. I don't know, you know, cheering oh, microcosm yeah. on. Yeah. Like, At one point, um, not to spoil it, but we were running together after May queen and we ran through a campsite and an entire campsite full of people were like, TJ, like cheering, like 13 people were yeah. cheering so loud for you. We still have no idea who they were. If that was you get in touch because I'm your new biggest fan. It's just cool because like, you know, we I work, I feel I work a lot behind the scenes on microcosm and I'm trying to, my objective is to change the culture of trail running and this never enough mentality that is so dominant in the space. And just to know that that ripple is out there, like I am making an impact. Um, I'm, am I can be my own worst enemy and my own, you know, biggest critic that I'm not doing enough, that taking any time for myself is weakness and all of these things that we, you know, I have to live the stuff that I talk about with my athletes. And this was a huge opportunity to do that. And a reminder of like that, the work that I'm doing is making a difference. And my work is, you know, is long, very long term. It's, yeah. it's slow, it's slow work. And it's not about short term uh, gains. It's about long term gains. Um, and, you know, many folks out there are riding, you know, one short term gain after another and trying to string it all together. And it's, it's definitely a different approach to do it the other way. Um, can you walk us through the last bit of your 
race? I feel like, you know, like at, at Twin Lakes, obviously, um, I got like a bad cough and it made me start throwing up. Mm. And I felt like we, like that tickle, like, I don't know, like if it was like dust in the air, aggravating my allergies or something, but I kind of was like, oh, I don't like that feeling. I had that going up the first, you know, the first part of that climb. You picked and, up your pacer, Sean, which was helpful. Right? Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. And like kind of rallied after throwing up there. And then we had a pretty good hike. Um, but the throwing up made me get side stitches because I lost a bunch of fluid. And so like on that whole climb out, we just focused on chatting and Sean's such an awesome guy and a great pacer, a great supporter. 10 out of 10 pacer. Yeah. Like we got the fluids going and for then for a while I was running really strong again yeah. and then I got nauseous and started throwing up. Um, and that's when Paul passed me and he was like, that was me 12 years ago or something. And I was like, <laughs> hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Commitment. Paul, you're rocking it. Like he's and, like running stronger now than, than ever. I mean, doing the Rocky mountain slam. I'm a big Paul fan. He, he was looking good and we chased them for a while, but I just, eventually I was like, I just got to like, make sure I'm staying within myself here. Yeah. Um, that's when I kind of changed things up, started eating some mashed potatoes, started eating more gels and like, instead of taking in Morton through fluids and like things, I think just got totally derailed through that section, uh, with my fluids because yeah. of being nauseous. Um, but having the side stitches, I was still trying to get in sodium because sodium always fixes my side stitches. And then of course fixed my side stitches and I ran super well until to outbound. Yeah. Um, and then ran pretty well. You were still like right behind Paul at outbound. Yeah. Like I, I was well in the top 10 and it was like, I was like, I'm, I know I'm going to finish. Like I'm yeah. doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then on power line at the very top of power line, on the descent going down, I got really nauseous again and I could not run anymore mm. uh, because the feeling of dry heating and stuff was just too predominant. Like it was just like power hike and not deal with the, like those feelings of dry heating or run and like have to throw up. Yeah. Um, so I defaulted to, you know, advice that I got from my coaches is like, you know, you're going to walk a lot in this in the second half, last quarter of the race. Like, it's slower than people think just, you know, any forward movement is good movement. Yes. And I just was like, you yeah. picked up ultimate stoke machine, John Levitt. Yeah. Friend of the pod podcast host at for the long run. He shaved his beard. So he also had an identical red mustache. And yeah. that is what friend, that is what adult male friendship is all about. No, but he was like, he was super supportive. Um, I enjoyed, you know, that time and picking him up and like, we, we, you know, it started to get slow. And I was, yeah, it was just too slow on that section. And I knew it, but like, I was just like, you know, whatever, like I'm still moving forward. Like it's all good. I just didn't judge myself for it. Tell myself I should be somewhere else, be performing a different way. Like I was pushing my limits as much as I possibly could and was just nothing but grateful for that. And, um, you know, getting down to, to make me that section, I just had so much nausea. Mm. And, um, ah, God, like, you know, the cumulative stress of the event, you know, it's probably not one thing. It's the combination oh, it's like of all the, it's all like a the mosaic stuff. of discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when like, I got there and I was, that was the low, really, that was the low point of the race. You sat down. Yeah. Because like I needed to get some fluids going and like, it was weird because my visualization before getting in there was I'm not going to sit, I'm going to grab Zoe and go. And something, something happens like around the arrival to that place um, that changed my mind and I sat and- Oh, we had Spindrift. Yeah. We were trying to drink. We thought you had overdone it on sodium. So we wanted you to drink some water that didn't have electrolytes in it. Right. So like, I think I sat to do that to make sure that I didn't get nauseous or something. And that was when like, it was, I don't remember how long we were there, but we got, I was there for too long and I got only really, like four or five minutes. I got cold yeah, so fast. 
Um, and then people started to get worried. And then yeah. I was like, my, I need to regulate my nervous system. And I was like, we, that's not going to happen. That's know, not but... an expectation <laughs> you can have right now. Right. And I was I, like, oh, just I just want to regulate. Breaking news, it. your nervous system is going to be fucked up running 100 miles. Like, this is not a meditation retreat. Shit is going to get weird. Well, you know, I... I appreciate that. And I think that's a very realist approach, but you know how I am. I like wanted to like take a breath yeah. and you know how like in dragons, solve. in dragons, they have the like personality thing. You're like, you're like lawful good, right? Like that's your personality type. I'm chaotic good. So like, I think, and you can see that in our personalities at like the end of these ultras where it's like Zoe goddess of chaos reigns supreme and like TJ, you were like truly like lawful good, so polite, so nice all day. Um, but like, I think that, yeah, it was just like, it took you a sec to accept that like, this is going to feel gnarly at the, like, or it's going to feel like it, if it feels like you're past the point of no return for quite a while Yeah, in your body. Like you, it just, there's no feeling like it, which is like partially why we do it. Right. Well, and I think like you have the benefit of having a couple hundos under your belt and for you know i pr'd my 100k by a long freaking yeah. shot in this race and like i you know that was only my second 100k and so for me everything was brand yeah. spanking new after yeah. mile 62 and so you don't really know like totally. I, I remember right, right. like sean has a video of me like how do you feel you're running so strong right now you know we're rocking like nine minute pace which is like on a slight downhill this is like objectively not fast for me yeah. at all and i was just like dude i feel so tired oh my god like <laughs> i don't know i just feel so tired yeah or it's like when when you paced me at rio del lago on the last section i was like redlining because i could i was like within a minute of the second place woman and i was like chasing her down through mile 99 like closing on her the whole time so epic so proud of me still <laughs> yeah and i was like oh my god i'm running so fast and then i went back and looked at my like my like strava afterwards and i was like full at nine minute <laughs> like <laughs> i thought like i felt like i was like i if you had asked hero me how fast mode. were you running i was like 620 pace for sure <laughs> i'm a hero i'm going so like yeah. oh <laughs> <laughs> and tj very politely was like good job <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny though, because like our like our our uh, the way that we perceive ourselves yeah. gets so dis disillusioned or contorted by yeah, like yeah, yeah. the day. By fatigue. <laughs> That's so wild, man. Oh my god! Like just like all right. So getting out of the chair at uh, May Queen, I was like, I just need another minute to regulate my nervous system. And I started getting really cold and yep. shivering, and you guys like forced me out of the chair. Yep, you were like, screw that. It, we can it regulate while we walk out of here. The most painful experience of my but life. But it got better, right? Oh my like god! Within a couple, I minutes. thought I really thought at that moment, like that I was like gonna like die or something. <laughs> like it was deep, deeply screwed up. Like how bad that felt. <laughs> I think my eyes popped out of my head. Like, it looked bad. It, it was, didn't look good. I wish somebody had the video of that, you know? Oh, like, someone has it. We have a video <laughs> of you sitting in the chair and it fully looks like your soul has left your body. <laughs> You're just like sadly holding a thing of I think what potatoes. was happening was my soul was re-entering <laughs> my body at that point. And it was like, here you go, buddy. Here's the hard part. Yeah, like, so we put you in a puffy <laughs> and we were like, let's go. Let's yeah, just go. Yeah. Like we, if you want to cry, if you want to, if you want to feel bad, I know, but like, if like we have that option, but you're going to have to do it while walking. You know that I was fully committed to the finish, no matter what. I know, but it was just the like the longer the you sat there, that was going to just be harder. Yeah. And I really wanted to get to bed at a reasonable hour. It was a big motivator for me. I know you love uh. your nine o'clock bedtime. <laughs> And we could have gotten that 9.30 next time. A 2.30 bedtime is also great. It wasn't terrible, honestly. Um, but yeah, you paced me and um, getting, you know, those first probably like a couple hundred feet. Not I, pretty. It was not. Like I was shuffling, walking in pain. And then we picked it up. Then we started running the downs yeah. a little bit, jogging yeah, yeah. where we could. Things and started looking like, really good. Man, the nausea was just like... Ah, like no matter what I did, I just could not run for more than like 30 seconds without wanting to throw up. And I didn't want to waste time stopping and dry heaving 
So I power hiked like whatever I could as fast as I could. Yeah. I mean, you were moving like walking, yeah. you were walking really strong. It was a, it was a, like a I, I'm celebrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. walk. That's it was like, like not bad, dude. That's yeah. like, that's, it got us there. It got us there, but it took freaking forever. Yeah. Like, just like non-judgmental here. It yeah, just yeah. It objectively took an hour longer than it should have had I been able to run and like, or run consistently. You know, I ran like as much as I could. And the, the, the thing that's so crazy about Leadville is like the last, I don't know, five miles, they're all uphill. Oh, they're and every it inch is like dude. Every inch is uphill. And it's probably like a 6% grade. And it's just like, Grindy oh god shit. man like it's it, as when, your pacer yeah. i was like fuck dude this, this is not like, fun this is just hard and it's like wow the last couple miles um you know i think you did a great job of pushing me to run and keeping me accountable to like you know holding my potential whatever that looked like yeah whatever that was and trying to still go for it and i'm super proud of that like part of me like reflecting back is like, you should have just thrown up more and like gone harder David Goggins style or something. But I'm like, that's not me. No. Like that's and, like, not I think, my you know, attitude. One of the things that's nice about having a crew, like realistically, I was pushing you pretty hard to run and it wasn't working. Like your brain and body were not there. So I think it's always just useful because cognitively at the end of a hundred, you're just not, 100% there and it's always so easy in your right mind to look back and say why didn't I do this why did I do that why was I so slow and you just have to realize that like the mindset you're in after 100 is wildly different than how tired and effed up your brain is you know when it's mile 20 or 22 plus of the day and I don't think that those I think that like there's some like dwelling and ruminating are, are just like that's the enemy of good hundred mile experiences yeah i agree and so like i haven't been spending much time with that yeah you know since finishing and and everything i think i've been really just focusing on on recovery yeah nice you did it i did it yeah the recovery has been wacky i will tell <laughs> you like it's cognitively like the body <laughs> first 24 hours was not pretty. No, not I tried to pretty. like, oh my gosh. give him a burrito in bed and he just like couldn't sit up to eat the burrito. Mentally, I didn't have the capacity to eat a burrito. Like it was just too, like a little baby. how much you give of yourself to these races is wild. Yeah. With the focus and how much it just like, it gives you so much back. Like this is just one of the most fun experiences. I had fun from the first step to the last step, I had fun. I had a smile on my face, I think the entire day. And like, it was just like transformational for me in that sense of like, just being able to have so much joy in so many different iterations of the race um, and be so accepting of like all of the, the awfulness of <laughs> those last 13 miles. Um, but also the fact that like, after the race, you know, it's, it is easy to criticize. And I haven't really been in that mindset. I've, nice. you know, I've, I've taken the time to try to really integrate this experience. And I think like in the past, I've moved on from races really quickly and not gotten to take some of the important lessons with me from those races as a result, you know, diving back into coaching and, and business and stuff a little too quickly. And I've really tried to be mindful of that right now even though people are you know reach out for support and um i feel like i have an important role as a coach but at the same time um integrating this experience can influence my coaching um you don't know what 100 miles feels like until you've done it and you definitely don't know what the recovery is really like until you've gone yeah, and it's it. different for every race and every athlete totally but there i'm sure are a lot of similarities. I think the biggest challenge for me right now is getting that mental battery yeah. back. Like the amount of naps that you were I like nonverbal for a day and a half. It was so hard. Like I was so tired. I've never been that tired. We couldn't like, let him drive. No, like driving to your book launch on Monday night. I thought it was unsafe. Like I was like, I'm just too tired to be in yeah. a car. 
Yeah. I was like, I need to take the bus home from this. Like, honestly, I swear. Like, it <laughs> I, was know, I know. Why? I was concerned. I was just like, how do like some of my athletes like want to start running four days after one of these things? I'm like, you guys not are crazy. Not crazy. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Not you. Not me. <laughs> no. Like really, really focusing on, on deep rest right now and not doing more than I need to do. Um, and making sure that like, I'm not coaching people when I'm tired, like waiting till I have the energy and then doing the coaching so that that feedback is really high quality. I'm not kind of like just trying to get it in there. It's just been yeah. such a, I don't know. This is a wild experience. It's wild. definitely going to change. Um, my approach a little bit to coaching yeah, athletes too. So. I have a lot of takeaways. Um, you know, one, I think like we really over like ah, there's like almost this over emphasis on, on like really, really long, long runs for races. Um, and I think like th there should be more focus on trying to do workouts that play to the specific demands of the event. And what I mean by that specifically is like, when you've really gone through a lot of your mental and physical resources in the first, say, 60 or 70 miles of the race, you have to still be able to move efficiently. And so how do you do that? Like, what does your shuffle form look like as an athlete? Like, I saw my shuffle form and I'm like, that looks really inefficient. Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't look like good, efficient shuffling. Like, how can we get better at running when we're deeply tired? How can we... Um, simulate that more through workouts and specific workouts on long runs um, that play to the actual demands of the sport, like more than just like a marathon, you know, and this is something that I'm slowly been incorporating into training with specific athletes who are my higher level athletes is these fatigue building workouts mm -hmm. that force athletes to do a bunch of running later on really, really tired yeah. legs to develop that shuffle. Um, another thing is like the eccentric loading. Yeah. Like we really, really need to over prepare that mm. even in runnable races like Leadville. I think yeah, that I mean, the muscular breakdown is just unreal. It's and unreal. The, like I was remarking to Sean, like, I can't believe how sore my legs were at 40 miles. Yeah. And I've run a lot of 40 milers. Yeah. Just the amount of running specific to this race created so much breakdown. Um, yeah. And I think that also like, Maybe, you know, there's more room to think about this stuff from an ultra running specific perspective around building fitness mm. um, and incorporating more cross training and yeah. things like that to up overall training volume, mm. especially with athletes who are a little more running limited. Right, right, right. Because of experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jackie, who won the, the, the women's race, her peak week was like 54 miles she had some femoral stress fracture. So she was pretty volume limited and she did great, like yeah. super strong performance. She you know? rocked. She so awesome. I think that it, yeah, you, it's, it's all about like finding what training works best for the specific athlete. And also I think there's some really cool takeaways there that like injury can be a springboard forward, right? Like when you adapt to it and when you recognize the realities of like what your specific body needs to grow and progress and to succeed. And that's just another reason why you have to work with a coach for years and years. Yeah. You have to develop that relationship with yourself totally. and with somebody else who can kind of play that checks and balances with you without that. Um, and you're doing it alone. There's so much room for error and you miss things. You see there's so many, we have so many blind spots. Like I discovered a lot of my blind spots uh, particularly with nutrition, with sodium intake and the balance between sodium and fluids, which I thought I had a great grasp on. Clearly I didn't. And like, um, man, like it's such a gift to have these experiences because then you get the opportunity to chip away and work at this stuff a little yeah. bit more and improve. Any final, before we wrap this up, any final reflections? No, I feel like I've, I've reflected on this. I'm curious, you had a big week. Let's finish up and just wrap it up with these Chumbawamba moments. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your book launch and yeah. a tough book review that you got. Oh, yeah. I wrote a book. It came out the day before Leadville. Wouldn't <laughs> recommend doing that. We nailed it. We, we nailed it. We did. We really did. I think that we're a fucking awesome power couple. Like, huge props. And I think that part of being a power couple is you don't intentionally seek it out. You just, like, accidentally become a power couple. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like part of being a public figure is your work gets disseminated far and wide, right? Like I wrote a book, a lot of people are going to read it. A lot of people are going to have opinions about it. I got, I wouldn't even say this is an opinion because it's clearly someone who didn't read the book. I mean, they said in the review, they didn't read the book. Um, I don't even have the review top of mind because that's not healthy or like particularly mentally safe, but um yeah, I mean, some guy just, I mean, some guy wrote a review that I, 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 I don't want to dignify it with a response other than that if you're out in the world and you're making cool stuff that reach, reaches a wide audience, you are going to get every possible bit of feedback possible. Yeah. You're going to get the whole spectrum of it, right? Like there's probably a lot of people who haven't read my book who have said, yay, I love this. Great. But like, yeah, this one guy, oh yeah, his essentially his bit of feedback is that no one would want to get me pregnant, which is kind of comical in how divorced it is from the content of my work in any way and how it's not in conversation with my ability. I think that a big challenge of being a female writer, particularly in the world of endurance sports, is that so many people will always judge you because of who you are, what you look like, the stuff you write about, rather than even saying, hey, I actually read your book and I disagree with it, which like I would love. I would love to, I, especially if you know on the team has that feedback, baby, give it to me. I want that. I want to have these hard conversations. I want to grow. I want to progress. Um, but I'm also at a place where I am no longer accepting of or listening to any feedback. That is stupid. Yeah. And, and this was some stupid uh... feedback. So if you read the book, please send, write a review that's actually helpful. Show that it's still meaningful to engage with the things people put out in the world. It's super helpful for writers and I appreciate you. Yeah, it's just, a, you know, I guess as a partner, it's just upsetting to see you still receiving feedback like that. And every day, just every it, single day. It just never goes away because nope. you are such a public figure. and Because I'm a woman taking up space and saying things and writing things and trying to, you know, critique the status quo. And people don't like that. And they do not. so they consider it a, an attack on their, their, you know, personal philosophy, their ideology, their uh, way of being, and they don't know how to handle other people's perspectives. And I think, you know, when you lash out like that, it's a strong indication that you have nothing interesting to say, yeah, you know, but like deeper, you know, that there's deeper stuff going on totally. there and their inner world is disrupted. And that's, you know, a, a point of tension and friction. And I think for them, and it's just an opportunity for us to say, you know what, like, Hey, we are making a difference. Yeah. Cause like when you frustrate people like that, your, you know, like your stuff yeah. is working. Yeah. And if you feedback giver are listening, uh, betterhelpedout.com, super great. Use my discount code Zoe69 for a 0% discount at checkout. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. All right. Well, I love the spirit of that spirit of helping. I sense there, yes. Zoe. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, in other news, at mile, I don't know, was it 98? I have no idea. 99? Time I think it was mile 93, but I have no idea. Zoe proposed to me. I did. And shout out to everyone who listened to a hundred or an hour and 20 minutes of this podcast for getting the juicy bits at the very end. They may never We wanted this. to bury the lead so deep. So deep. But I said yes, obviously. Yes. <laughs> so we're engaged now. Very excited. Yeah. yeah. Pro tip, um, propose to your partner when they literally can't run away. Or say no. Or say no. Because they're so tired. You can just drop their ass. <laughs> I wasn't dropping anybody at that point. <laughs> right. But if you had said no, I could have just like zoomed off to the finish to have a beer. <laughs> you could have been waiting there for me with a celebratory beer. Also true. Yeah. We've been waiting a long time. Yeah. It, I mean, I'm going to take it a sec. But, you know, I figure, you know, I think that, you know, we spend so much time just essentially like shuffling through the woods and talking together. It felt like a really meaningful place to ask that meaningful question. Um, you know, we talked about this in our last Leadville episode, but we, before we were dating, you paced me at Leadville from Winfield to Twin Lakes. And I, you know, I, it was kind of like a, a, um, a watershed moment in our relationship as friends. And I thought that for the next stage in our relationship, like, why not start it going 1750 pace into Leadville at 2 a.m.? Very process oriented. <laughs> exactly. No, it's perfect. It was an adult conversation perfect. had by two consenting individuals walking in the woods <laughs> at midnight. 
Don't underplay how romantic and amazing it's it so was romantic. for I'm our really relationship yeah. in our world. I crushed it. You did. It was awesome. Like and subscribe for more relationship tips. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. If you've got any feedback, positive or negative or in between, we don't care. Uh, <laughs> use our discount code, <laughs> Microcosm Coaching 69. Uh, yeah. And if you want support uh, in your running journey, endurance journey, visit us on the web, microcosm-coaching.com. Contact us at microcosmcoaching at gmail.com. See you.